talking about geography. Oh, yeah, I was talking about how badly you guys injure yourselves. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's great. It's I have a bad one. Let me tell you. Yeah. 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 Oh, my God. I said, Isn't that Mary? Yeah. 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 Is it really? Well, that was us doing uh, the other oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we did that day on July yeah, yeah. June 20th. Checking oh out the vineyards. Gosh. Yeah. Oh, oh well, you should tell us about what harvest is like. Oh, gosh. Too. Yeah, tell us about harvest. Talk about that um, day, yeah. It's uh, coming along, you know, it's, it's, it's slower and later than the last few years. Um, but, um, you know, it's just like always once it hits, it hits. And so it's, it's coming along. The nice thing is, is that it's just, you know, there's lots to do, but it's not this urgency of, oh my God, we're going to have a week of 105 degree weather. Yeah. You have to, so you, you know, got to move. Yeah, we're, we're like, okay, we want to pick this, we'll pick it now. Very we want to pick this, too. we'll pick this now. And we'll, you know, it's, it's as things develop. Um, so it's, it's very nice so far. Um, we want to <laughs> make sure that uh, the weather stays nice, and I wouldn't mind a little more warmth mm -hmm. uh, as we continue on, because, you know, now the days are getting shorter. Five. It's five. All right. All right. Should we do a quick sound check? Oh, God. Yeah. Mine's worse. <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. We're just doing a quick sound check. Sorry. Robbie and I are comparing sports injuries or, let's say, um, klutz injuries in my case, sports in his. But uh, we just want to make sure you can hear us well. And um, we know some of you have signed on, uh, but we just want to get a little validation there. Please validate us. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to just, obviously, if you've got uh, any technical issues, just uh, ping them, and um, we're very happy to welcome back to school Alex Fondren, who is our producer and the behind the scenes, Hello. helping putting this together tonight, so thank you for that, Alex, and I'm Hello. extremely excited to welcome Robbie Meyer. Good to be here. Yes, and he's showing, you know... Good signs of getting through harvest, but it's only just gotten kicked off. What just was your going. first day? Um, well, it's been a couple of days now, but um, we're uh, you know primarily getting Sauvignon Blanc in, so we're just at the beginning of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So long, long road, road ahead. ahead. Long road ahead. Long road ahead. An exciting road ahead. Yeah. Well, we're going to be um, lifting the veil and, and getting to know Robbie a lot better over the course of the next hour. And he is the winemaker for Myriad as well, um, which Charles Thomas had the great pleasure of working with over the course of the last decade on and off. And uh, it's a stunning property. I, I need to say that. You've seen it in the pictures. But um, on a good day without traffic in the Bay Area, if you time it right, you can get there in about 55 minutes. So I like to say it's a region in Livermore where you can commute to and you can get to first. It's the first real viable wine region, you know, right outside the city. Um, so it's, it's, it's charming, and you know what I also love about it is lots of great back roads. Yeah. Um, you love to bicycle. I know you're yeah. more of a mountain biker, but a lot of people who love to cycle, cycle there because there's, you know, lots of shoulders, and it's uh, undulating and not too challenging. Um, and we'll be talking about the effect of that undulation and the yeah. elevation as, as it relates to the winemaking and growing. And we're going on what year now, Robbie? Is it year four? Help me out. It's here. about sorry. yeah four years since I really came on as as uh, one record mirror as well. Okay. And I always like to clarify that you know it wasn't new to me at that time that I, I did know the the Winty family who owns Mirror as well. Uh, and had tasted the wines for years and years and, and really knew them quite well before I even began working with them professionally. So. That's right. You and Carl made wine together at Peter Michael. That's right. That yeah. was right, like 20 years ago. Was he your intern? He or? was my intern. Oh, okay. He's got a few years. I've got a few years on him in terms of age, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it remains one of my icon wineries for sure yeah. in terms of, you know, first introducing me to California when I was living in New York all those years ago, 20 years ago before I moved here. Um, so yeah, what a great place to, oh, for sure. to for grow sure. grapes and to have a great team to make wine. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, let's see, where do we really start? I think it might be fun to, to talk a little bit about um, 
the history of the property, okay. if you don't mind. Yeah. I know it was 1884 that it was established. Yeah, so yeah, that's and that's one of the, the things about like with me working there, what's so fun is, is I like to say, you know, it's a, it's a part of California history. And uh, it's rare that a property has been around that long in any form, been farmed for that long, for 130 years of farming. It really helps define the estate and uh, understand what's planted where and how uh, that all comes together. Um, so it was great history um, that, uh, uh, you know, again, being passed from the Winty family who now owns the property um, back to its origins and the, the clonal material, the plant material that was originally brought on uh, to the property. Um, a really just a fascinating piece of, piece of California history. Yeah. yeah, so I'm sure a lot of you know this, but it, it's important to reinforce the sort of I think unsung history that Livermore Valley has with respect to California wine legacy. Um, you know, the Chardonnay really being cultivated there in the early 1900s uh, with the cuttings brought in from Merceau and Montpellier that have provided the foundation for California Chardonnay to this day, 80% of plantings, and also up in Oregon for that matter. Yeah. I, I was just talking to a winemaker at Bethel Heights about their heritage when he was 30 years old up there. That's great. And then of course in your case, at Myriad as well, with the 100 acres that you farm, mm -hmm. um, you know, Chateau Margaux and Chateau Dicam with direct lineage. Phil Wente of the family is, um, you know, a scholar yes. and a gentleman, yes. like you, yes. and uh, he has done exhaustive research. Um, and of course, the the original clonal material I understand from the Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc from Ecam right. is traceable in the vineyard. And then the the Cabernet itself traces back to Margot, but there's still some some research being done to kind of see if there's some very uh, you know sort of heritage vine stock that, that right. might be traceable. Well, you know, the idea, though, that it's really, I think, fundamental is that uh, when Louis Mel, you know, came to the property, you know, he was uh, seeing this from an agricultural sense that this was a great place to uh, grow grapes and to produce wine mm -hmm. and, um, you know, source great plant material and brought it over here. And that's the special thing. It's nice to have these fancy names of where it came from yes. and beautiful material. But to me, what's so more romantic and true about the property is that it's been farmed for that period of time. And um, you know, plant material and clonal material change over time. But it's fascinating to think that you know, here I am in 2018 thinking about harvest, and 130 years ago, someone was there on property thinking about harvest and, and what was growing, the, the right varietals in the right area and the right nook of the entire property there. So that's a really special thing. It's true. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the, the way the property is oriented because there's a there's you know a swath cutting through it that brings in gravel from a riverbed and some elevation and soil types. I'd love you to maybe just give us an orientation from a 10,000 foot view. And right. We can dial it in with the lines. Right. Well, and that's what makes it it's special um, to have an estate property uh, can mean different things. Um, what I really like uh, from the standpoint of the estate of Muria as well is that we have lots of altitude changes throughout the property from down through the arroyo, down the old uh, riverbed there as it travels up to the, the top of our, our highest hilltops. Um, you have distinct three distinct soil types that, that uh, pass through the property and even beyond that, you know, one soil type, they change. And um, so having uh, this dynamic property to work with, not to mention different aspects and uh, conditions on every acre of those 100 acres that we're farming. So having that diversity is very beneficial because every varietal doesn't want the same environment to grow on. You know, I, I can use the Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, would like uh, the more gravelly soils that sometimes exist down in the lower portions of the property with next to the arroyo or even up on the hillsides. At the very top of the property on the, the hills, there's a little bit more uh, clay composition to those soils and Merlot would prefer that type mm. of soil. So again, it's this, this history of farming that's really important because it's finding which varietal will grow best in which particular area. And, um, and having multiple plantings of the same varietal in different areas mm -hmm. is going to give you different expressions of the varietal. So exactly. uh, it's just a lot of fun. So since your arrival, what would you say would be the most significant thumbprint in the vineyards that you've kind of achieved? Well, you know, what we're constantly trying to do that we'll continue to do, that you're always trying to do, is just improve, improve, improve. Um, what we spend a lot of our time on um, out in the vineyard these days is canopy management. Mm -hmm. And that's addressing how the plants are growing throughout the growing season and trying to get this, you know, uh, ongoing mandate that we always have. We want, you know, some piece of light, some portion of light on some portion of the cluster during some portion of the day. 
not all sunlight on the whole cluster for any portion of the, you know, the day. And we don't want any cluster hidden within the canopy being uh, in shade all day. So it's maintaining that is very difficult. It's not something you do on one day. You do it throughout the growing season. And doing that intense canopy management, bringing all that um, uh, focus and work on what we're trying to do and create is, is challenging mm -hmm. and uh, it's fun. They're showing in the lines. I mean, I've known these lines for a long time, and I just um, I have to applaud you. I think they've always been expressive. That's a, that's a given. But you've got this linear um, architecture as well underneath the beautiful florals and aromatics that we're going to explore tonight. In fact, I said to you when we sat down, this room smells like a flower shop. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's just lots of beautiful things, if you know, emanating from the glasses, and we look forward to hearing your comments um, throughout the evening. And it probably is a good point for a little. Uh, reminder of hashtag Marietta as well for tonight. That's two R's, one T. Unlike Marietta, That's right. Georgia, where you're from. <laughs> now, now I'm misspelling both words incorrectly. It's a common thing. Yes. So we, we really don't quite care as long as you love it, drink it, write about it. So yes, we're going to talk about Joaquin Marietta later on. But I'd like to hear a little bit, and I know we'll talk about the wine, so I'm sure people have already gotten a start with that, but yes. talk a little bit about your upbringing in Marietta and what got you into the world of wine. Yeah, yeah. so Marietta, Georgia is a suburb of Atlanta. If, if, when I was growing up, no one knew that. It seems like people know that now, but anyway. Um, so, you know, I always loved working in restaurants. I just, I like the whole scene. I like what I call restaurant people. And um, it's just fun. And so I started doing it as a, a very young age, busting tables and washing dishes. And, um, you know, just really appreciated the whole dining culture. And eventually, when, you know, I was a young teenager, um, I was introduced to wines that were being served at the restaurant. And, uh, you know, a mixture of wines, kind of, maybe kind of what we have here, but it might be an old, uh, Bordeaux and a young California Chardonnay and a Gewürztraminer or whatever the case may be and just the comparison and the dramatic changes amongst wines fascinated me mm -hmm. right away mm -hmm. and then you know I, I want to learn more, I want to learn more and then once I understood that how these wines are produced and that it's biology and chemistry really appeal to my sense of science yeah and so I like that as well so I just went head first into it and just tried to read every book I could and learn everything I could about it uh, eventually became a wine steward at the restaurant when I was 18, and this that was a lot of fun. This is the place planters that you were that's mentioning right, earlier, right. which is like a, yeah. it's no longer a restaurant, but it's yeah, a historic property. Yeah, I think the property. doors, are, that shows you how old I am now, that it's, <laughs> it's shuttered up, but, um, but anyway, it was a great um, entry point into the, the wine industry. I didn't think of it as the wine industry, it was just I loved wine. Mm. And then I uh, continued on to the University of Georgia and studied biology and chemistry there, and um, that led me to think, you know, well, what am I going to do with these degrees? And I wanted to work outside. I loved California. I loved wine country out here. And, um, of course, if you're into it, you've maybe heard of UC Davis. So <laughs> I ended up going to graduate school at UC Davis. And uh, that moved on and then started working. How started would you say that California um, impressed you as a, as a Georgian when you came out here? What was it about California that... Um, excited you, you know, beyond the wine culture. Yeah, beyond the wine culture. Well, you know, I, I, again, I had come out here many times when I was younger, and uh, we had, it was really a cousin, we called him uncle, was over in Burlingame. So I had been to the Bay Area many times and throughout California, um, but it just, it seemed like a good energy here. Mm. And um, lots of opportunity for experimentation. Yeah. Uh, you just, know, that's one of the things I've noticed having been a transplant from New York. Yeah. It's just. Um, it's not as quite as conservative correct. as Atlanta might Yes. Be. Yes. Or Georgia might or be. Georgia. <laughs> yeah. Right. Which is very different now from probably when you. Oh, got absolutely. To, yeah. Become much more of a global, global yes. city. Cool. Well, I think we should probably take a take a jump in to glass number one. There's okay. a few questions. And there are some kind of questions. Like side. So um, let's start with a question, and then we can move into the whip. Okay. Um, Thanks. Okay, lots of questions from Mary Orlin, our friend, wine fashionista. Um, she kind of wants just a confirmation of how old the vineyards actually are, which I think would be good yeah. to repeat. Um, how many acres of estate vineyards and what varietals are grown? Yes, so they're, uh, first going back to the vine age or vineyard age, which uh, can be different things. So the property has been farmed for 130 years, and it's often a question that people ask me, what are your oldest vines here? We don't have 130 year old plants. Um, uh, the plants, each vineyard block, uh, is farmed as long as it's viable. 
and that can be uh, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Um, some vineyards you'll see around around the world, you know, can be 70, 80 years old, but eventually a vineyard will um, start to fall into decline. And so we want a mature, healthy vineyard that's producing great fruit for us, but uh, at the end of the day, every vine has its lifespan. And so we don't have 130-year-old vines, we have 130-year-old vineyards that have been farmed for that period of time. So. Uh, it's, it's what's exciting about it is that we have the clonal material that are descendants of that original material that was brought over 130 years ago, and that's how plants work. We can have a discussion on clones <laughs> another time. Yes. Um, and then what was the other questions about uh, not vine The age, varieties that are The varieties rented. that are grown, yes. Mm -hmm. So quite a few different varieties. What I, rather than giving out a number, I try to name everyone <laughs> myself and Let's see if I can remember it. So <laughs> orange muscat, muscat canelli, viognier, chardonnay, sauvignon blanc, um, uh, I'm going to move on from whites and come back. So we got uh, Grenache, Syrah, Morvedra, I mean, not uh, uh, Grenache, uh, Morvedra, Tempranillo, um, Cab, Cunoise, yeah. uh, Cab, Merlot, Cab Franc, Petit Verdot, uh, Malbec, <laughs> um, Malvasia Bianca, which you haven't even said that. Um, <laughs> I think I'm getting close. I got to get close. Do Oh, we have we have um, the Tariga Nacional, the Susal. Did I say Tempranillo, didn't I? Yes, you did. Yeah. I think you did say Tempranillo. Um, yeah. And then follow-up question orange from... <laughs> orange, I said orange He did. Yeah, yeah. Follow-up question from James the one guy. Have you or will you produce a varietally labeled Semillon? I'm sure that comes from the UK. And we didn't even say Semillon, did we? <laughs> um, uh, oh, my God. Well, we... <laughs> We'll always do uh, whatever it is that's going to, you know, highlight our passion, highlight the vineyard, highlight uh, everything that we're, we're doing there. Um, you know, there was a, a Semillon Chardonnay blend uh, in Murad as well in the past, and I wanted to separate that out because uh, that was a little bit of an odd blend to me. And we have our Sauvignon Blanc varietally designated wine, and we have our Chardonnay varietally designated. So we don't have the Semillon as a varietally designated wine at the moment. But, um, you know, we certainly farm every varietal individually. We pick every varietal individually. We produce it into a wine individually. And so we have that Semillon as an individual wine. It's quite good. And actually, in the vineyard this year, it's never looked better uh, in the vineyard this year. So who knows? Maybe now's the time to do that. Really nice. Yeah. I love it. So I know you fine-tuned. And when we talked about the whip in the past, you've talked about how you like it be described as a Sauvignon Blanc. Well, the uh, core framework, it, yes. as a core to yeah. the to the structure, right? And That's how, right. How would you say it's kind of evolved over your time there? Well, um, again, it's just it's it's just a matter of um, focusing in on what we're trying to do. So, um, you know, I thought of it more from a blending perspective. Okay, what are we doing here with it? Well, it has this core of Sauvignon Blanc. Okay, now we have an identity there. They have this core of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so we know we're going to have that beautiful acidity to the wine. We know we're going to have the expression of Sauvignon Blanc, which I can speak to that also, which, what are the different expressions of Sauvignon Blanc? And we chase a more fruit floral component of Sauvignon Blanc as opposed to green grassy element of Sauvignon Blanc. So that's the Sauvignon Blanc we're starting with, love mineral expressions of that. But through the blending process, what can we do to accentuate that wine? You know, for the whip, the style there, we want it to jump out of the, the glass aromatically. You said the room smells like flower, flowers here, floral. Mm -hmm. So where can we go into the property and find that? Well, we do have orange muscat. We do have Viognier mm -hmm. that, when well ripened, can really give you beautiful expressions of that. So then we're going to, to work with those uh, varietals to develop the aromatics. Okay, we have that. Uh, what about the mid-palate? Where do we go there? Um, we have the beautiful Semillon again, um, the Chardonnay to fill up the richness and develop the palate a little bit more. And uh, then of course the Sauvignon Blanc itself provides that beautiful finish and great acidity. So using the different varietals, we're not having to chase the expression of a single varietal. We can chase the style of what we're, we're after to navigate a great food wine, mm -hmm. to have something that's beautiful and expressive and enjoyable. Um, so we can use all these varietals that we grow so well on the property to bring that together. And so it's all through that blending process that we make that happen. But so the core of Sauvignon Blanc is to keep us focused mm -hmm. and to have a starting point of how we're doing the blending. Yeah, it's really delicious. Really, really delicious. Talk, if you wouldn't mind, for just a minute, too, while I know some questions will come in, but um, just since it is harvest time, how, what are you seeing so far? I mean, for the vintage? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, I know we talked about it a bit off camera, but maybe yeah, no, that's that's fine. Yeah. I, I can I can talk about it every day. I know. <laughs> um, I know. So what we're seeing right now is um, we had a very very even growing season, which is really really great because it gives you. Um, we know that we're going to achieve the ripeness levels that we would like to. Um, but it's also been very moderate, especially for the month of August and into September. Um, we've had some warm days, but relatively, you know, very moderate. Well, that allows the fruit to what we call hang time and sit there on the vine and really continue to develop flavors and develop complexity to the grapes themselves. If it gets really hot really early sometimes, uh, it just shoots high to ripeness and you don't get the same development you do uh, when you have a cooler year like this. This is not a cool year, it's just moderate conditions. So we're getting lots of hang time. We're able to pick all the varietals or any block that we would like to pick as it develops as opposed to panic mode when you have a 105 degree temperature coming your way and, and you know are forced to pick something. We've been able to pick through just as we'd like to. So yeah. it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it sounds like a blessing of a harvest since we all know California got a tough year last year in the middle of harvest yeah. for the most part with all yeah, the fires, fires that came through. So we're just feeling really fortunate. For sure. Um, all right. So this one is, let's talk about the vintage for this yeah. particular wine. 16, is it not? Yeah. The yeah. 2016? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what was the vintage in 2016 mm -hmm. like, or, or how is yes, this a, a reflection of that? Either, either yeah, way. Yeah, we, we had, you know, it, it's, it's very funny. I was talking about this yesterday, you know, from, uh, we're in 2018 now, which looks, you know, so far so good, but certainly 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, we've had a, a group of vintages here that have really been some of the best vintages, I've, this is my 23rd, and um, some of the best vintages have just been these last few, and to have them back to back to back to back is pretty incredible. Mm. I mean, we certainly will have one or two vintages back to back. Um, but uh, having this, this long uh, run of great vintages is, is pretty impressive. So 16, it reflects that as well. Um, uh, 16 different than the ones surrounding it more so would be that um, it does have great aromatic expression in 16. Um, we really, really like the, the components that came out in the aromatics of 16, not just the white ones, the reds follow that as well. Um, the tannic structure of the reds seems to be very imbalanced in 2016. Um, a very approachable tans, but, but not soft, but approachable. So 16 was a great year and reflective in the whip as well, especially for that aromatic profile. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know you're a foodie as well yes. as being, you know, an accomplished winemaker. So um, and in all your travels around the country, and tonight we have a preponderance of folks from California. Okay. And do we... Um, do we have our South Carolinian on, on board? Oh, thanks for being here, Clifford. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he put us this location. What was it? It was, was a bit harrowing. It said, formerly the site of, oh, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, it, it, uh, from the future home of Hurricane Florence. Oh, dear. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. Um, boy, oh, boy. I, um, I'm glad you're with us. Thank you for joining us tonight. Because uh, we've got some people in the room who have relatives in North Carolina and... Uh, Whoa, it always seems like there's some sort of interesting weather event, as the oh weather boy. people like to call it, right? But, um, so we've got a nice diverse group here from Washington State, and Ohio, and Oregon, as well as California. But um, talk a little bit about some of the things that you've enjoyed pairing this with. Just um, With know. a whip in particular? Yes. Well, so really every wine we produce at Myriad as well is about being a wine in balance that is a food-friendly wine. Um, one thing about the, the whip, and as we get to the spur later on, that's, that's really impressive, is we try to make these dynamic wines that have a broad range of food pairing capabilities. So um, that is an important piece of the puzzle. To me, just something about it, the, the expression is also balanced by that beautiful acidity on the palate, just as it's Thai food to me. It, mm -hmm. it, like, it just, it, it's, that's it's such a perfect pairing to mm -hmm. me. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it really... Uh, can go with like all sorts of summer dishes, you know. How about uh, grilled Georgia peaches with some burrata? You know, there you go. That sounds <laughs> great. I love that. I was thinking about, you know, uh, my mom used to always uh, put strawberries in her salad. Mm, and my boyfriend does that. I love that. It's that, it, really it's actually a nice common, touch. But it's a nice yeah. touch, and that would go beautiful uh -huh. with this. So, um, uh, any, you say, you know, with grilled peaches, grilled shrimp, um, you know, those types of dishes. Uh -huh. uh, it really has a wide, wide range. Well, some of our, um, Participants and bloggers tonight are on, you know, on different time zones, dinner time. So oftentimes with these tastings, folks are 
pairing the wines mm -hmm. with something they're eating. So we'd love to hear what you might be cooking or enjoying this with. That'd be fun. Another thing I think would be delicious with this is like, no pun intended, but a Meyer lemon, mm -hmm. like zest in yes. a very simple pasta, you know, with like gorgeous cheese and just, I would say something that's on the subtle side that then in turn will let the wine not compete too much. Or, yeah. the, and there's elements too, when you said that, I was thinking of like almond and other things yeah. that go with that. And so while this wine itself is not necessarily nutty, that would be a perfect complement to this, mm -hmm. you know. Um, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Now you're, how often are you on the road for just just interacting with consumers and getting, you know, getting out there? And I'm curious to, to hear what you've heard from people, you know, just in general about their wine consuming habits and, you know, what, what you're learning when you're out on the road outside the winery. Well, um, you know, how often do I get out? We try to get out as much as we can. Unfortunately, when we go out on the road, the grapes are still growing, the vines are still <laughs> growing, and the wine is still uh, continuing to, to follow through its aging process. So we always have to check back in at the winery. But we do like to get out on the road and see people and talk to people mm -hmm. and see where our wines end up is, is a, a great fun thing. So, you know, the general trend, um, again, for after doing this for a couple of decades, is that people are becoming a lot more educated yes and um, that they have their own ideas and opinions without you know a lot of times you'll just hear people regurgitating other information that they found out there uh, people know what they like mm -hmm. and um, they're also very willing to try and be introduced to new things yes. so um, while 20 years ago the idea of having the the whip blend with Sauvignon Blanc and Orange Musquet and Chardonnay uh, they might be confused by it. Now people just immediately, oh, okay, and they're interested in the blending process. This is why you did that? Very cool. We mm -hmm. like that. So, um, a very engaged public, I yes. guess, is what I see. I think that's very true. And I've seen, too, a bit more of, you know, a lighter trend in dining. Um, you know, the paleo craze is big, the, you know, uh, the, the, obviously that sort of derivative diet, and I see that people are, um, you know, being more conscientious of what they're having and, and really thinking thoughtfully, as you pointed out, about what they're pairing and, you know, being a bit more a bit more moderate. Yeah. Um, so it's nice to see, and I love seeing the hyper-regionality in food, too, yes. you know, all around the country. Yeah. It's just so great to see that continuing to be, like, stressed in, right. in dining experiences. But let's admit, that rosé would be awesome with an In-N-Out burger. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Or your favorite version and, thereof. Or Let's the, not be uh, too high and mighty here. <laughs> yes, the, the, the rosé, as my friend Heather likes to say, what doesn't it go with? Oh, I know. And um, mm -hmm. it, it really, I mean, it's been a lot of fun uh, producing this wine because, uh, you know, when we uh, decided that we would like to do a rosé for Myriad as well, you know, we it was a new addition to the portfolio, so you have to address it from the ground up. Well, where do we start? What, what varietal are we going to use? I love rosé of Pinot Noir, but we don't grow Pinot Noir on the mm -hmm. property. Mm -hmm. um, so immediately I was, of course, drawn to the Grenache for those rosé out, lovers out there. I think that's mm -hmm. one of the best varietals to start with. I agree. And right next to the Grenache is, was an old planting of Cunois. Um, uh, so that's very rare. You don't often work with Cunois. So that was drawn to that. And you know, the Grenache provides this beautiful spicy quality mm -hmm. to it by just by varietal nature. And then when you farm it, for rosé. You know, this is not an afterthought rosé. We're farming this rosé. It's whole cluster pressing. It's it's really making this with the full intention of making a great rosé. So when you're farming it for rosé, with most of these varietals, you can really enhance the fruit floral component to it. So we can get that with the Grenache. But the Cunoise next door is known for its beautiful acidity. Mm -hmm. And we want to make these all food wines. So we have the, the um, Cunoise to blend in with it. Well, kind of going with this, this Rhone theme and uh, those varietals, we do grow more vetter on the property, so I thought what a great way to build out the mid-palate. Yeah. So that was a newer addition to the, uh, the, the two other varietals in 2017, and it really made it something special. It really expanded how it can pair, mm. having that, that mid-palate to it. Um, it's uh, an incredibly complex rosé. It really is. You know, I, um, I spent a lot of time in Provence in the 90s, and I fell in love with rosé early on. Um, of course, you had it in various forms there, whether you could buy it in frac, right. you know, in a great quantity for the rest of the week or buying particular producer-driven wines. Right. Um, and it just, I would like to say early on, just a big fan of having it year-round. Um, and I'm just so glad that you, you made this. So I'm trying to think which vintage of, 
how many vintages of the dry rosé have there been? Is this the third? The third, this yes. This is the third one. Okay. Yeah, well, it's, it, it is, it is. you were saying, like, year-round, and, um, you know, we're just talking about the food pairing capabilities of it, that rosé, absolutely, have it in the summertime, have it as a picnic wine, have it by the pool, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But have it as a real wine, too. Appreciate it when you have one that is really developed, then bring it to the dinner table. Mm. Have this with grilled salmon, have it with, you know, your entrees, make it something that's a part of your your full dining experience. Um, it's that mature and grown up. It's true. It's really true. And I love the idea of the deliberate rosés, and I think a lot of people aren't necessarily aware. I know this sophisticated audience is, but, um, you know, farming for rosé is, um, is um, something I'm loving to see. Right, you know, making yeah. Making it a deliberate, thoughtful wine. Right, yeah. and doing, employing the techniques of whole cluster pressing and really going after the beauty of what the rosé is. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we put dry rosé on the label because we did want to... Uh, really bring home the fact that, hey, this is a serious wine. It has nice texture and acidity to it. Um, it's not an overly sweet rosé. And maybe those have their places too, but there are a lot of those out in the marketplace, and ours is not that style. Mm. So talk a little bit about your overall philosophy behind blending. Uh, you've talked about these two wines so far in yes. terms of you know what they're driven by and and they're framed by, but but speak a little bit more to that. I, I do a lot of wine judging. Right. Um, you do tons of tasting. I've noticed in wine judging, for instance, we have sort of two categories when it comes to blends. We always say thoughtful and deliberate and mm -hmm. kitchen sinks. You yeah. Know? And I'm just curious That's to hear true. a little bit more about, I, I would imagine, I know that you make mono variety wines mm -hmm. as well, yes. um, but um, I, I, I imagine that making blends is something that really challenges you more perhaps or yeah, it's, in a well, different way. It's a different way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's interesting because it, it takes two different things and, and combines them. So the first is, is that we like to farm uh, very, very deliberately. And I like to farm acre by acre, and not just farm for the varietal, but farm that varietal for how it's growing on that little acre of land, that small parcel. And we'll develop um, that throughout the growing season, really try to get the most out of what that varietal can do and how it performs on that, that parcel of land. Farm it and pick it as its own entity. Produce it into wine as its own entity. So we have the best possible expression of that one varietal we can. So that's fun, mm -hmm. but why stop there? And so you can you can always look at every single individual lot, like say we're talking about Sauvignon Blanc, you know, I don't just have one little Sauvignon Blanc, I have multiple lots of it, and they just have different strengths and weaknesses. So I start to put them together mm -hmm. for their strengths and weaknesses as a varietal. Well, why stop there? Now we have these <laughs> other varietals that we can work with as well, so really try to put together this beautiful painting and puzzle mm -hmm. um, that can come together of a wine that's very, very satisfying, that you're not, you're no longer chasing the varietal concept. You're chasing something that's an, an expression, something of beauty, or, or you know, a, some of the parts. Exactly. Yeah. So, and usually, when we do this, when you do blending correctly, the 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 sum should be better than the parts, you know, greater than the parts. I agree. And so um, it's really fun to see. I mean, you see it in an instant when you put these wines together. So yeah, and I think that's the the magic of either making wine or cooking is. Um, the art of making the complex appear simple, you know, mm -hmm. because there's a bunch of little decisions that go into it to then in turn deliver something. But then I find them to also be, you know, they're they're satisfying, but they're also contemplative too. It's like, what's what else is going on in that glass? Absolutely. Yeah. Questions. Yes, some questions for okay. sure. Thanks, James everyone. Melendez, there's a couple of questions. Um, so the first one, James Melendez would like to know, he says, um, why do you call out dry, the dry rosé on the label? So, yeah, I kind of mentioned it uh, briefly, but the, um, the just the idea that there's a lot of rosés out there that are sweet. Um, you know, there's different trends in wine, and um, that is a trend of sweeter wines that, that aren't labeled as sweet, aren't labeled as dessert wines, certainly, but uh, some have an alarmingly high level of residual sugar in the wines. And so we toyed with the idea, do we put dry on there or not? And it was important enough for us to, to point that out, to really go, hey, this is serious, you know, this mm -hmm. is a real food wine, mm -hmm. um, enjoy it like you will, but this is, you know, it's serious. And let's be honest, we know that a lot of people um, mistakenly won't drink a rosé because they think it is sweet. That's absolutely you know, right, really myself do. included. If I wasn't familiar and yeah. I you know, went into you know, a certain uh, store or on a list, you don't know what it is, you might be shy away from it. And as Jerry Seinfeld would say, not that there's anything wrong not with that. Not that there's anything wrong with it. <laughs>
<laughs> but still, yeah, the, the savory is yeah. is really charming. I'm also getting almost a seabed kind of cool, you know, miner- I don't know what I would call it, but something almost maritime about it. Uh-huh. Maybe it's, well, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, sure. So the east-west uh, orientation, orientation of the Livermore Valley yeah. is, again, something else. And this is something I have to tell you all. Please, please, please. I know you're all good researchers and writers, but so many times I hear people say, oh, Livermore, too warm. How, how is it they make wine there? Well, we're here to turn that on its head. Um, you know, that, that transverse valley really pulls in, you know, the cool maritime air and creates nice wind. Oh, for so sure. So I'll let you speak to that a bit more. But it's it's extremely important to really not make generalizations and to really get into the nitty gritty. And that, number one, includes coming out to visit. But also, too, hearing more from yeah. people like yourself, informed individuals who are walking the, the properties all the time. Yeah, no, I would say that, uh, that I definitely <laughs> consider it in more of a cool, moderate area as opposed to, like, I would consider Napa being hotter. Um, for sure. So yeah, most valleys are many time uh, wine growing regions have the orientation where they're north south, and you know you have that orientation. Whereas the Livermore Valley is east west and really truly opens up right to the Golden Gate. So you have that that direct influence from the ocean coming up every morning or, or every evening rather. You know pushes the fog in, and and it's there heavy in the morning time. So it really maintains that that cool environment. During the day, we see it recede, and we see the, the temperatures warm up mm-hmm. into a very good way. But even when the fog is gone, you know, you constantly, if you go up on the top of our sack out hill, the mm-hmm. highest elevations, it's you have a nice there. breeze. Yeah, yeah. it can mm-hmm. even get gusty, but yeah. you always have airflow through there. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's so important for many reasons. Even when it is warm, um, you know, I really like airflow throughout the canopy and throughout the fruit zone. It really acts as almost like a convection oven would mm-hmm. of really getting even ripeness around the fruit. We don't want to, to really be growing grapes in very stale areas that don't have any airflow through there. Yeah. So airflow is a very, very good thing. It has a drying effect when you do have moisture in the air. So mm-hmm. we love the way that the, the valley sets up. I, yeah. I think that Livermore is a bit modest, if you ask me, from the standpoint of really tooting its own horn mm-hmm. about its soil vari- its soil types, its, its climatology, uh, its diversity of mm-hmm. varieties, its history and legacy. Well, that's the main thing, too. It's like that the, it's funny to me if people aren't as familiar with Livermore, and it's like, you know, this is such an original hotbed. It is. You know, it's like, uh, it's funny. So. Well, I always think that, you know, Napa, for instance, being so famous worldwide, um, just kind of got its marketing, you know. In line. In, yeah, the yeah. jets were all aligned and fueled, <laughs> and they took off like a rocket for sure. Whereas, um, you know, quiet, successful Livermore right. sort of like right. sat there and, and it. You're going to, I want to tell you that you're going to see a lot more coming out of the region from the standpoint of science. Uh, soil studies. Uh, I know that there's been a grant awarded and they're really excited about digging in and getting um, more quantifiable data that can be shared because we're all yeah. really curious about it. So um, yeah, I probably should let you all know, just doesn't hurt to, to remind you that these first three wines are really the ones that are in the broad market. Um, these are kind of the ones that people that are reading your columns and your posts are probably going to be able to access really easily. And then there's a whole another set of wines as well when people come to visit, which we'll talk about later, but just briefly, um, that are um, just at the winery. Okay, so th- tonight we wanted to kind of offer you ones that are in the marketplace, but then we threw in the Merlot as well as a special little treat. So, mm-hmm. and of course, um, everything you need is all on, all listed there for facts and text sheets and things like that. Okay, a couple more questions actually. Good. Um, Mary Rowland wants a slightly deeper dive on where the minerality comes from, maybe just kind of listing of the soil types quickly for everyone. Um, in, in the rosé or just the minerality in general? I think in general, I mean, a lot of people have jumped ahead of it. So, yeah, um, okay. Yeah, so maybe. Well, does it, I, maybe, I'll, and if she can type more to the question, I'm happy to, to go into it. Um, and maybe the question is, is the expression of minerality uh, truly mineral expression coming from the soil? And this is a long debated question mm-hmm. and how it's traced and tracked. And, um, you know, I won't get too much into that other than, yes, the grapes are relative to the soils that they're grown in, uh, in whatever way, shape, and form that may be. And there's no doubt that the, the same varietal grown on the same property, even in two different soil types, will have different expressions to it. Um, but the minerality uh, that's there in wines in general 
um, is often there uh, in wines, in, in many wines, it's such a delicate nuance though, a lot of times it's overpowered. And so through, whether it be our extraction techniques, our ripening techniques, our oak programs, uh, whatever the case may be, a lot of times we'll overshadow a beautiful minerality that's there and we don't really get to show it off. So, uh, you know, that's part of the skillfulness of the grape growing process and the winemaking process if we're able to get those nuances out of there. So, um, but if that's only a partial answer, if she wants to be more specific, I'm happy to go back and do Let that. Let us know, Mary. Yes. Um, <laughs> And then a question was brought up um, a little bit ago from Steve McIntosh, Wine Anthropology, um, that I think it's important that you answer, saying, assuming that the grapes going into these wines come from the same vineyard source for the Wente uh, Vineyard Bottlelands, um, how or who decides which wines get which blocks? Yeah, so there is uh, a specific set, well, the Wente family owns Myriad as well. There is a specific set of blocks and, and the property that's contiguous with the historic winery are myriad as well. And so, um, you know, we use those and, and we pick our blocks that we make our wine. Uh, so that's myriad as well. Um, it's, 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 you kind of get blocks. the pit. You get, you get your pit. Well, you get to pick what we like for myriad as well. That's yes. nice. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah. It's very nice. Those and are the rewards for being a talented winemaker. Well, that's the, the, <laughs> the rewards of having a great property like I that. Know. And having you know, the diversity of the land Absolutely. that allows us to grow all these different varietals. Mm -hmm. but. No, we have our myriad as well. Um, it's a defined area. Mm -hmm. And um, it is that we haven't mentioned, but it is sustainably farmed. Mm -hmm. And so you see, you know, um, boxes for raptor birds, yes. uh, owl boxes. Owl boxes, um, yes. We, we bring in the, the falconer during harvest time to keep the, the existing crop safe from uh, other birds that might be in the area. So Right, because yeah. it's kind of a migratory yeah. um, channel in some ways, yeah. isn't it, I believe? Yeah, and what else on the practices in the vineyard reflect Well, that? you know, it's it's really everything that we, we do from top to bottom, from the materials that we use, from the, the, the use of crop cover crops, um, um, water management, mm -hmm. I mean, from our, uh, not just, you know, using drip irrigation type of thing as simple as that, but our water, water monitoring and how we're really in touch with uh, all the analytics of the water uptake of our plants, the respiration, the water needed that's properly needed, not overwatering, etc. So um, it's really from top to bottom and in the winery itself. So Well, yeah, um, because you joined right after the drought was sort of out of the woods in some ways, right? We were looking at, oh, was it 2011 to 2015, 2016, thereabouts, where we had the highest stress in California yeah. and we got a bit of a break. 15 was the worst. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I was there at, during 15 as well. So. Um, uh, yeah, but you know, it's it's really that's the the funny thing is is vines, grape vines, really don't require that much yeah. water. I was and gonna say it's always been pretty good management to begin with. Yeah, right? exactly. Well, well and, Carl's and, cared about that quite yeah. a bit. <laughs> and yeah. and it wouldn't have been there for 130 years if no. it was far. That's right. <laughs> exactly. So. Exactly. And, and Mary was in fact interested in the minerality specifically in the rosé. Okay. In um, the rosé, yes. but uh, okay, so. Um, then we can go on and say, where does that, like you mentioned kind of an oyster shell or mm -hmm. how you, you worded it, and I, I like that. Maritime-y kind of quality, the yeah. saline There's a saline quality too, it's, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, I almost define that different than minerality, yes. but, but it, it is, it's for certainly, um, certainly there. And, um, you know, where are those expressions come from, again, uh, it, that would go lead back to the farming of this and farming it for rosé. So that is for their canopy management and opening up the, 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 the fruit properly to get this level of ripeness um, and uh, meaning not overdone. Mm -hmm. So we're picking the, for rosé a little bit early. We want to pr pr preserve that acidity that's there and get that great expression. So it's, it's farming it in that nature. If I was making this Grenache for Grenache, you know, I might leave it out there longer, really want to enhance, you know, the color extraction, et cetera, and, and then the winemaking process, um, working on the extraction. So we might lose that minerality in doing so. so. Mm. But I'm not going to get into the argument of does it come from the mineral uptake. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it's the great question that's being debated and discussed. Yes. You know, especially yes. of late. Yes. Which is kind of 
I'm glad we had the luxury of being able to have those conversations. Absolutely, you know? the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that, going back to what I see around the country, and that, that those, these are questions that people ask that are very, very sophisticated uh -huh. you know, questions. So. <laughs> well, we only have about 20 minutes left, and we've got two okay. red wines in front right. of us. So I think we shift gears, and let's talk a little bit about... I know that originally when the property was built, um, it was when Louis Mel established it in 1884. Mm -hmm. For those of you who are history buffs like myself, um, he made it into a gravity flow winery. And now, of course, the wines are made nearby in the in the facility that um, is right adjoining, um, which more which is more modern and yeah. um, equipped for all sorts of small lot right. and separate lot uh, right. fermentations, etc. But talk a little bit about your general you know, approach when making red wine. And I know it depends on the variety and everything yeah. else. But yeah, I'd love it. When, uh, let's use the spur as a... As yeah, a and the spur is um, a, a great counterpart to the whip. Yeah. You know, there's another thing that we'll say about both the whip and the spur that they're a survey of the property mm -hmm. because we're really using the entire property and, you know, from the lower elevations to the higher elevations, all the soil types and situations and aspects for all these different varietals. We have, you know, the Cabernet Sauvignon, we have the Merlot, Petit Verdot, Cabernet Franc, um, and even Petit Verdot, and I mean a Petit Syrah into the blend. And uh, we're using the entire property to grow all those different varietals. And um, so the, the, the idea again with the spur is to have a complete wine, deliver aromatically, deliver on the mid palate, deliver on the finish, have something that's broad ranging when it comes to its food pairing capabilities. And we, I think, accomplish that in different ways between the whip and the spur. Yeah. You know, it's, they're great uh, counterparts to one another. So, um, you know, if they're, we talked about the core of Sauvignon Blanc for the whip. Mm -hmm. We might say with a spur, we're going to focus on Cabernet, Sauvignon, and Merlot is going to be the core. Mm -hmm. um, those percentages of our, our, uh, uh, our blends change from year to year. If I could talk about that for a second, you know, we're not focused on saying, this blend is going to be, you know, forty percent Cabernet and twenty percent. It's what not recipe wine making. Not recipe wine making. Oh, it's God. what the expression of each varietal is for that vintage, yep. and then putting those vintage expressions together to get this style. Mm -hmm. So, but we're always going to be focusing on Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot as the core of that. Which is a nice tribute to the heritage too. Absolutely, yeah. that's a very good point Order too. Heritage. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I really love and we'll get to the merlot next but um i love having that upfront fruit expression that the merlot offers it's yes, a, it's a direct red fruit expression that shows through so so nicely there's also like a beautiful kind of spicy herbal note that also will tip me off to merlot at the, at the very get-go you know and, and as i think about these wines and I, i'm sorry to interrupt no, I hear I like you it. speak more but um what I love about these wines is I think they're a beautiful bridge wine for, there's an, there's an appeal, and I said it earlier, there's like a complexity that they're also, you know, if you feel like you don't really want to like dive super deeply into the glass, you can just have a pleasure experience. But if you really want to get studious, there's so much here to be able to talk about. Absolutely. You know, and I think that's, I'm not trying to flatter you, but honestly, but I just think that's an incredible art to be able to achieve as a winemaker, because you're, you're sort of, I won't call hedonist because you're a disciplined man. You ride your bicycle <laughs> all the time. I'm a hedonist. I don't know what I'm <laughs> <laughs> But you know, if you're 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 a disciplined individual too. So the, I think I always like to say that sort of the personage and the um, style of winemaker often is reflected in the wines. You know. Well, uh, it's it's fun, and, and we have a great time doing it, and, and you're talking about the, the approachability, and you know, what we always say with the spur is that it has to have the yum factor, and it has to be delicious in nature. That's really a, a motivating goal with making the blend. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have these fancy things that we might talk about, and I'm saying what's centered around Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. That's true. But at the end of the day, we're just like everyone else. We want to sit down and go, that's a delicious glass mm -hmm. of wine. That's what matters. Not that it's Cabernet or that it's Merlot, mm -hmm. but it's a delicious glass of wine. And so that's what we're chasing with a spur. And I think this hits that. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, if you want to go and analyze it, like I did, because I'm a wine nerd, <laughs> and go, oh, I get that red fruit expression from the Merlot. And, and when you said spice, I always like lean when I can get the Cabernet Franc out of it. I love that. I love being able to pick that up. And I, I get a spice Franc from the Cabernet fan. Franc. So, Franc fan. Um, mm -hmm. And so it is fun to, to break it down and to really get into all the layers that it has. And, and this is the type of wine that the longer it sits in your glass, it does evolve and mm -hmm. change. And it's a lot of fun to have, but it's got to have that yum factor. Yeah. yeah. So 
Okay, Alex, there are questions. Well, while you're on that, yes. um, Julia Crowley actually had this question a long time ago. Oh, um, sorry, Julia. We're getting there. <laughs> We're getting there. I talk too much. <laughs> no, but no, no. Um, no she, she said, I know I'm way ahead. This has been real on the whip. But have you ever considered making a cab front forward rather than a cab south forward um, blend for the spur? The life is so short, there's so many opportunities out there. <laughs> um, I think we think of everything. And the, the cab front on the property is really, really great too. And this is what's fun is like, you know, coming from our friends over in marketing there, you know, Heather, um, that, you know, it's like, oh, you know, we really would love to have some more Cabernet Franc. And it's like, okay, we can do that. I'm going to pull out some Merlot. No, don't pull out the Merlot. It's like, well, we, we only have so much land and, you know, we can only do so many things. So, um, uh, yeah, exactly. So um, we would love to do more Cabernet Franc, and we will, and we, we develop new vineyard blocks, and, and um, you know, we, we love the Cabernet Franc. So it's not that. It, it, but, uh, yeah, even if I wanted to do a Cab Franc leading blend right now, I'd be hard pressed to come up with a tonnage of Cabernet Franc I would need to do that. So. Okay. But if I'm not mistaken, is there not a Cabernet Franc driven wine available at the winery? Yes, the visit, of course right? there is. So when you come to visit. You, yeah, small production. Small production, it goes mm -hmm. sells out pretty quickly, so yeah. <laughs> come get on the, the list and, and become a club member and you can get some Cabernet Franc. Yes, exactly. Um, and then Mary Orland would like to know what your blending process is. Um, when specifically do you blend this for? That's a great question because um, a lot of times people don't perceive that, uh, you know, it's, you see these percentages on a label and you think, okay, we sat down one day and we put it together, but it's not like that. Um, and even when we have like the Merlot that you'll have next, the Merlot is in fact blended. Uh, it's blended, like I said, I don't have one pick of Merlot, I have multiple picks of Merlot. And I use Merlot in different, you know, wines. So I've got to come along and say, from this lot, I want three barrels of this lot, and two barrels of that lot, and six barrels of that lot, and we blend those together. And we start that blending process of blending um, uh, varietals together, the same varietal together, very early on, certainly like after malolactic fermentation, so from 2018, January of 2019, we might begin blending barrels together. And then we'll find some special lots, and I'll say, you know what would make that lot really good is a little bit of petite verdot or whatever the case may be. And so three months later at the, the racking process, we might incorporate a little bit of petite verdot in that. And it goes on and on and on. We have uh, our eye on the spur early on, and I know that what I'm, you know, I'm trying to get to these various lots uh, to that level, but it's kind of combining this and that along the process, and, and we marry things over a period of time. So it's not just one day we sit down the day before bottling and I sit down in the tasting lab, put it together and put it into a tank and we're done. It happens over time. So I wanted to just take a quick moment and I love all the I like going from analysis and nerdiness to, you know, fun and cultural things yes. too. But there is a deliberate reason for the names of the wines. Uh, the whip and the spur. It's not just some fanciful thing. Um, there is heritage on the property. The reason why it's called a well yes. is because there's an artesian well still running to this day from the 19th century when you pull up and come and visit. That's right. And of course we all know, you know, if you're if you're looking to plant grapes, you always look for, you know, where the fruit trees are growing right. and then is there a good water source and all that good stuff. So that definitely fed into this. So yes, so Joaquin Murrieta was um, around during the gold rush and was known for being the Robin Hood of the time, for sure. But the, that's, a, the, that's a heritage to him, is the, the spur and the whip, because he was a horseback rider, you know, riding the, the wilds that's of California right. in the 19th century. That's so, right. Mm -hmm. And then and then he would bring his horses there to that property to water, to water the mm -hmm. horses. And, um, you know, like you said, that, that's an indication of the water that's, that's there, that's good, that's been there for a long period of time, mm -hmm. and being the well in and of itself, how the, the soils themselves uh, are fractured and, and can collect that water, drain that water. So um, it speaks to a lot of what goes on on yeah. that property. Um, so yes, that's uh, where the name is derived from. And to this day, one of the one of the one of my favorite pieces ever written about the region was by Josh Sens, who's a local writer here, and he wrote um, in Via Magazine, which is a AAA travel magazine. But he said, when you're in Livermore, you can be in a tasting room and you can be standing next to a cowboy and a high tech guy or or, or woman from uh, the Lawrence Livermore lab. Mm -hmm. Like you'll see PhDs and cowboys mixing and kind of you know jostling each other for space at the tasting bars. 
Um, there's still, there's really great, the Wente family has been really responsible for preserving a lot of the land out there. Yeah. Um, there's still a lot of cattle uh, raising that goes on. Do in we fact, have horses around? You've got horses right next to, you know, some of the vineyards yeah, there that are absolutely. Eric Wente's horses. And, and uh, I don't know if you've ever gone riding. Of course. I haven't done it yet, but I oh, used to do that. To. Yeah, which I want to do. And then, of course, the cattle, too, on the property um, go into the restaurant. And, and they're fed wine. I'm sure not be right as well because, you know, <laughs> maybe it's the pumice. You know, but uh, the cattle get that, which is great. So that's still very much a big piece of the legacy, which is Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Yeah. And while we're on the, the naming, um, um, Amy Crane Power would like to know, um, who lives in Houston, by the way, do you find the whip and the skirt especially popular in Texas due to the clever names? Yeah, it's very mm -hmm. funny because oh, yeah. I had not even thought about it, and you asked about going out on the mm -hmm. road or whatever. Um, we, we did go uh, mm -hmm. recently. Uh, to Dallas, and uh, I think we're going to go to Houston, aren't we? Sometime soon. Isn't that so, a uh, Johnny Cash song? Go is that Jackson? It's Jackson. I'm going to, go to Jackson. 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 <laughs> sure. um, so, yes, we did find that to be very popular in Texas, and it, I don't know why it had not dawned on me. But what's really funny is that um, with the cuisine, I think they're really good pairs too. The spur is so delicious. We went out to multiple restaurants and we're like, it would be absolutely perfect here. Although I did like the dry rosé with fried chicken. Yes. That was delicious. Mm. Mm. <laughs> here we go, back to the south. Yes. <laughs> um, I have to say, I don't know if you read it yet, but um, I have it at my bedside. I still have to pour through it because I have family in Alabama. Uh -huh. and, um, I've been mid going back and forth quite a bit. Um, and Time Magazine had the South as a, as a cover story a couple weeks ago, talking about, that. oh, you got to read it. I will. It's all about, you know, some of the great cultural inspiration, the fact that so many people are heading that way for, you know, a change of lifestyle. Um, I will say myself, with family in Alabama and, and uh, in South Carolina, that, you know, it's just still the holdout for gentility in many, many ways, oh, and yeah. hospitality and generosity of spirit. For so, sure. um, yeah, you got to read it. I will. Yeah, I will. it's got the uh, future governor of Georgia on there. Okay, uh, I like that it. That young lady, what's yeah. her name? Um, lady. I am famous. Yeah. Do you have a question? No, just quick time check. Um, probably time to move on to the Merlot. The yes. Merlot, okay. Well, we, we know. Well, <laughs> well, we're Southern, so we're trying to... That's right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, There's no, no time. time. We're in a rush now. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're not going anywhere. Set a piece. <laughs> um, so, uh, I hit my South Dog when I need Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Um, so the Merlot is, um, uh, yes, we don't have this broadly available in the market, but we do have it available at the winery itself, along with uh, several other broadly designated wines that we offer at the, the winery tasting room. And we were just showing it here because maybe it's a good uh, comparison or, or an identity recognition. When we taste the spur, we see this beautiful yum factor, as we said, and these great expressions. But then when we go to the Merlot, you can see what I mean when we, we do produce each one of these wines for its varietal expression. And right when I go to this Merlot, it seems like Merlot to me. It has oh, yes. that beautiful red fruit up front. Like and a graphite quality to complete it. Complete graphite quality. Mm -hmm. I love that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. very warm, very inviting. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's also reflective of the Livermore Valley as well. Because when it comes to Bordeaux varietals, and we talked about that cooling trends that come through the, the, the valley, what I really love about the Livermore Valley and the Bordeaux varietals is that they ripen and develop slowly and they uh, are able to reach maturity with complexity. And so I farmed in, That's you what know, I'm aiming for. Personally. Right, and right. And myself. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> as I ripen and develop, I do like to, um, Become more complex. More complex. <laughs> yes, as I get mature. But the, um, you know, I've, I've grown grapes in Santa Barbara and Sonoma and Napa and, and now in Livermore and, um, you know, Warm areas can be great, and you can get great fruit expression, yeah. but a lot of times it's monodimensional. And that's fine, it has its place, but what I love about Livermore, and like in this Merlot, is that you get layers and layers and layers of complexity because of the slower ripening process mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. And we're able to reach maturity um, with maintaining all of those elements. So um, it's not just monodimensional, one particular uh, red fruit expression, it has layers and layers to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. What Merlot clones do you have? Well, you know, we have original, you know, plant material from, you know, that goes back for forever. So that's also what's fun about working here, here on this property is that, um, you know, a lot of uh, vineyard blocks have just been 
pass down and pass down and pass down. Re, you know, every time we replant something, um, which is you know every vineyard block probably gets replanted on average maybe every 30 years, 35 years. You know, we don't necessarily go to a nursery and have to get that. We have our own plant farm there. You know, so we can we can use resource our own plant material to propagate. You know, mm -hmm. for generation they don't continue to do that for generations and generations we're just we're doing it now more so uh, with Chardonnay right out in front of uh, Phil Winty's home there's a beautiful block of Chardonnay that goes to our uh, broadly designated period as well Chardonnay um, that's own rooted original heritage clone that hasn't left the property and I'm uh, just expanding out those blocks and, and propagate more it's good mm -hmm. stuff <laughs> yeah I think it was clone four in the Cabernet world that was first propagated. In right. Once, right. When you take it off the property and then take it to be cleaned up at the nursery or at the university, um, then they'll put the, the more drab names on it, like I clone know. four. Instead and of the family seven. name yeah, or exactly. something sentimental. Um, so uh, that's where a lot of those come from. So And it's okay to, to you know resource it. We can bring clonal material back from a nursery onto the property, no problem. Uh, but it is special that we have this material that's been on the property for a mm -hmm. long period of time. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. This is just so tasty. It's got a savoriness, mm -hmm. which I'm finding is a common thread throughout your wines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those aromatics and then that sort of beautiful baseline note of, of savoriness that um, is inviting and enticing. Um, I love the texture to this wine. Yeah. That, you know, that's something that's, for all wines, white or red, and actually I think it's probably more left out on the white wines that you know, wines should have a texture and a feel and presence to them. Um, not being tannic, not being aggressive, mm -hmm. but you know, it's a very uh, sensual feel to it when you have a wine that has texture and presence on the palate. And it's something that we look for um, getting proper extraction uh, out of the grapes once we brought, the, brought them into the property, how we handle them through the aging process. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important to develop that texture. And when so, you get it, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. I'm happy having the wine now. Exactly, me too. Um, so generally speaking, what would be what would have been the average skin time on these, and what would have been the regime in this wine? Yeah, generally speaking, you know, we'll bring the the grapes into the winery. We sort the grapes, uh, put that into the the tank. Um, you know, mostly whole cluster. I mean, excuse me, whole berry fermentation. We'll get a couple of days of cold soap to let the wine kind of open up and get some early extraction without alcohol being present. Um, then once the fermentation starts rolling. Um, We'll get uh, you know, maybe some more active pump overs going in there. Um, watch our fermentation temperatures to mm -hmm. see how the extraction goes. There's not a formula to it, no, so I, I can't know. say we do X, Y, and Z. Understood. But when yeah. we taste through, you know, every day we're we're uh, looking at, at what the extraction levels are and how do we need to have it a little warmer, or a little bit cooler? Do we need to pump it over more or less? And then you know maybe it's it's approximately two weeks that it's a skin contact. Mm -hmm. um, if we feel it needs to go longer because of that vintage, it's not giving enough. We'll go longer. If it's something that's you know a really you know warm vintage and it's giving lots of expression to it, again I want to maintain the elegance to the wine. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to over extract. Yeah. So hey, we'll back it back and we'll get it off the skins as needed. Mm -hmm. So. There, and it's and it can be even within a single vintage and a single varietal. You'll have individual blocks. Yes. The Merlot is not always made the same way. No, you know, that's right. It's, it's Generalization is the enemy of winemaking. Yeah, right? for no. sure. That's good. I'm gonna use that. You may. Okay. You're welcome okay. to have it. My my pleasure. Yeah, Alex. Alex had asked this question earlier um, when we were kind of prepping for this, and I think you've you've answered it. But I think it's actually worth bringing up again as we. As we get close to a conclusion, which is, you know, how do you maintain a focused signature style when blends change vintage to vintage? Right. Well, and that's precisely why the blends change vintage to vintage yeah. is is getting that right. consistency. And you know, as I, as I have said, that the, you know, each varietal will respond differently in different vintages. And so, in say 2016, you know, you might have had. That what you did have the Merlot that had really really great fruit expression to it, and maybe the Cabernet Franc did not have mm -hmm. as much. You might have a different year. Maybe in 2015, the Cabernet Franc had very expressive fruit expression, and so maybe you needed you know less Merlot and a little more Cabernet mm -hmm. Franc or whatever that case may be because you're you're painting this picture or you're putting this puzzle together, and uh, each vintage is different. So 
The fun part is, is we have all of these different pieces of the puzzle. Uh, yeah. And that puzzle is not defined, so I can use this one, this yes. one, and this one, and, and build it year after year into something that has a consistent nature to it, yeah. and has a style to it, mm -hmm. but doesn't have to be one single composition well, percentage of this and that. You're a father, yes. and you have a couple of young kids. Yes. So to me, I kind of think about it as, it's a, let's say it's like in the teenage years, you know, where one day they're this personality, and yeah. another day they're this personality, and you just kind of kind of roll the flow and, and you know, mitigate the, the, the changes and just be able to, to deal with the evolution of it as it expresses itself. That's right, that's right, yeah. I mean, right. they, they, they yeah. respond differently all the time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So if you're trying to tether yourself to one kind of scripture, it, it ain't yeah. happening, no. <laughs> and even, you know, when we have our variety of designated wines, the Merlot, for, exist, for example, you know, we will put small percentages of Cabernet Sauvignon or Petit Verdot and, and whatever they may be and, and each year I might do something different. Mm -hmm. So like one year I might put Cabernet Franc in and I'm talking 2% or 3% mm -hmm. and another year I might not. So um, it's really to get the varietal expression in the case of the broadly designated wines and how I use the small tools, those, those other varietals. And then when it comes to the spur, it's the style, that essence of the spur blend that we're working mm -hmm. towards. So different motivations, different times. Yeah. Well, so when do you think, will you be sitting down at Thanksgiving, Robbie, or will you still be cranking through? No, we'll, be, we'll <laughs> enjoy Thanksgiving. Um, that doesn't mean that everything might not be off the skins. No, um, this is true, that you can take a breather. We'll have our Thanksgiving for sure. <laughs> I'll insist upon it. Yeah. I know Carl was telling me yesterday that he was pretty much expecting to work right up until... until right up until then, for yeah. sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, there have been vintages in the last couple of years that were done surprisingly early mm -hmm. um, that we'll, we'll be working you know well into November but um, you know once we get the grapes off the vine and we get fermentations basically done you know it, it's fun I mean I don't yeah. mind it it's, 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 it's you know there's a beginning and an end so yeah. you know it's not as if it's uh, unpredictable yeah. you, know, you can't predict it so have we answered all the questions, Alex, that are out there? And uh, thanks for staying a little bit longer. I know sometimes a few of you like to do that, but um, yeah. yeah, I want to make sure we didn't lose any. There were a lot of a lot of great reviews and comments about the Merlot, but I think a good one to end it on um, came from Cliff from the future home of Hurricane Florence, who said, <laughs> "Even Miles would like this Merlot." Yeah, absolutely. Ah, <laughs> well said. Well like said. That. Speaking of that, I heard today that that sideways hotel they stayed in, uh -huh. I guess he and Jack, right? Yeah. Uh, where the, the llama experience, he yes. through the vineyards. Yes. Yeah, apparently that's been renovated, the one with Sandra O, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. now apparently quite deluxe. So look oh, what's really? happened. Yeah. This the thing. windmill or what yeah, is that Yeah, it's called? now called the sideways end. Yes. Really? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> exactly. No longer the windmill. <laughs> well, you know, thank, thank you all for being here. And yeah, Robbie, absolutely. thank you yeah. for, you know, just... All your talent and your compassion and your um, warmth and your yeah. energy. It's you know, fun. we're very lucky to have you in the world of winemaking. I'm so glad you came to California. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, it's it's great to keep those Georgia roots. And, That's uh, right. Yeah, thank you all for for joining us. And this is uh, yeah, we haven't had a brown life since June, so we're happy to kick off the harvest season with this one today. Awesome. It was really a pleasure. Yeah, to thanks to you. everyone for joining us, and thanks yeah. for having me here. Absolutely. So it's been a lot of fun. And thanks to the CCA team, Paul and. Aaron and Alex and then Heather in the background, Heather, Heather Everett, Heather. Who, who runs this brand and she, I think she uses a whip and a spur, doesn't she? That's yeah, right. absolutely. I, I think that's what I've heard. Yeah. That's what I've heard. Yeah, she keeps everybody on, on task. So anyway, thanks and have a really good night and um, here's a glass to the week of 9-11 as well. Cheers. Memories. Yeah. Take care.